Hello everyone and welcome to the first part of my analysis of infamous Festival of Blood. Published last October via the PlayStation Store as a standalone game, Festival of Blood came with a built-in move support, which was later extended to Infamous 2 through a dedicated free patch. Basically, there are now two move compatible Infamous games out there and they share the very same move controls implementation. It goes without saying that while this analysis focuses on Festival of Blood, everything discussed here applies to Infamous 2 as well. This is not to say you won't be seeing any move powered Infamous 2 footage though, as I will expose how the move controls work with regards to some of the powers only available in there. So story wise, Festival of Blood is neither a sequel nor a prequel to Infamous 2. While set in Numeray, Festival of Blood tells a side story which has Cole McGrath kidnapped by a group of vampires and his conduit powered blood used to bring back to life an old female vampire known as Bloody Mary. It did the trick. Man, her bite was like a pit bull with syringes for teeth. The more she drank, the prettier she got. Despite the extensive biting and blood sucking his subjects do, Cole doesn't die nor lose his powers, but eventually becomes a vampire himself, bound to die at sunrise but with the ability to fly. You're kind of badass as a vampire. I mean, being able to turn into a big old flock of bats, things like that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and I can eat a lot of bugs. Like crazy fast. It's awesome. I'm sure they'll make a comic book out of it. How does this fit into the whole infamous universe? Well, it doesn't. And that's because the story is actually made up by Zeke to impress a girl met in the pub. You are not from around here, are you? What makes you say that? I would recognize such a beautiful pair of eyes. Okay, so let's get this analysis going by looking at the control scheme first. Just like with the DualShock 3, jumping is mapped to the X button. But unlike the DualShock 3 controls, X is also used to engage the thrusters, as you simply hold it down to hover. With the DualShock 3 you need to hold R1 instead, and that's because otherwise you wouldn't be able to operate the camera while gliding. It goes without saying that using the same button and the same finger to jump and hover feels more intuitive, an action reminiscent of the double jump one we are all used to. Both the move and the DualShock 3 implementations of the gliding mechanic share a subtle assist that has the camera bending slightly downwards as the thrusters are engaged. The purpose of this assist is of course to improve the awareness of what's below you, but what if you want to look elsewhere? Well, in both cases you can of course orientate the camera as you please, but while with the DualShock 3 the camera swiftly pitches downwards at even the smallest variation of your gliding trajectory, with the move it sticks to the angle you impose with your wrist, resulting in a much smoother visual exploration of your surroundings. This is mainly due to a quite clever implementation of camera pitching, which I will discuss in great detail in the second part of this analysis, which allowed the developers to remove all the unnecessary assists from the move power iteration of the camera system. For example, while walking around with DualShock 3 automatically levels the camera pitch angle as you see here, when using the move the camera doesn't pitch at all as long as you hold the cursor in position. This is basically the exact opposite of what occurs in SOCOM 4, its move exclusive auto leveling routine resulting in a serious annoyance, especially online. In Infamous there are only two circumstances which trigger an autonomous camera alignment with the horizon, one involving holding the pointer within the dead zone as you see here, the blue square represents the dead zone, more on this in the second part of the analysis, while the other one involves melee action, which I will elaborate upon in a few minutes. Assisted or not, the one thing that really benefits camera management with the PlayStation Move is the simple fact that you basically never lose control over it, as it is mapped to the wrist, so to speak. This is true for any Move shooter really, but especially so for Infamous, as it makes a more significant use of the face buttons.
The ability to control the camera no matter what buttons you are using proves to be quite useful in other situations, such as when rolling during fights. Notice here how smoothly you can roll and rotate the camera simultaneously with the move. Rolling is on circle, by the way. And here is how it works with the DualShock 3. Notice how the thumb constantly moves between circle and right stick, introducing pauses to the camera turns, as well as decreasing the rate at which you can perform rolls. Relatively speaking, the need for the thumb to constantly move back and forth between circle and stick in order to circle roll proves to be even more problematic when you also want to aim at something specific. A little assist helps in keeping the reticle near whatever you are rolling around as long as it is in the center of the screen, but still, strafe rolling while aiming is something move allowed to do faster and more effortlessly, decreasing the idle times and de facto lowering the overall game difficulty. Finally, as this sequence demonstrates, rolling with the DualShock 3 while looking upwards asks for frequent camera adjustments as you fight the auto-leveling assist, which is not the case when using the move. On the subject of camera, an interesting feature allows to inhibit camera control altogether by pointing the move away from the screen. Notice here how the camera faces a fixed direction as I run around while keeping the cursor near the middle of the screen. Now see what happens when I point the move away from the screen. Notice how the camera follows Cole now, turning automatically as it attempts to place itself behind him. Here is a couple more examples showing the difference in how the camera frames the action when pointing the move at the screen or away from it. What basically happens when you point the move away from the screen is that the camera starts behaving exactly like it does when moving around with the DualShock 3 without using the right stick to operate the camera. Now, while you can still perform some actions such as jumping, attacking with melee or rolling, you can't of course shoot at anything in this mode since there is no reticle and you don't have control over the camera. As a matter of fact, the aim mode is inhibited while pointing the move away from the screen. Notice how pulling L2 does nothing. If you are already in aim mode when you point the move away from the screen, aiming is automatically disengaged. So the question is, what's the point of all of this? Honestly, I'm not totally sure, but here is a guess. Considering you can trigger this mode by pointing the move away from the screen in any direction, I assume this is simply meant to allow the user to release some arm stress without disrupting the flow of the game. Notice here how the camera doesn't freak out as I move my right hand to touch myself. That said, while definitely a nice addition, I think the pitching threshold could have used some amplification. While the yawing one is large enough to ward off unintended camera locks, the pitching one isn't as large and might trigger camera locks if you tilt the move too much. This never occurred to me, but it might happen to some people, especially when attempting to look straight up or down due to the way the camera pitch system works. But more on this in the next part of this analysis. Moving on, melee attacks are performed with the main move button, the triangle one used to perform more powerful attacks. The move button is also used to perform thunder drops, to impale vampires laying on the ground, 
how to kick injured civilians. Whenever you are beating or impaling vampires, the point of view adjusts automatically to add more spectacle to the proceedings, inhibiting camera control only when you hit your victim. Not really annoying, but you can definitely feel the brief control deprivation when using the move. Not so much with the DualShock 3 as your thumb is likely too busy hitting square to notice. As anticipated, this is also when the camera automatically goes level with the ground, but while it stays there when using the DualShock 3, when using the move it automatically pitches back to the original position, meaning of course you don't have to readjust it if you want to keep an eye on something above or below the horizon. Activated by holding down square, the Vampire Vision is one of the new powers available to call in Festival of Blood and serves different purposes. For starters, it allows to reveal disguised firstborns vampires amid the civilians for you to expose with a gentle pat on the back by a triangle. I will soon explain the purpose of doing this. The Vampire Vision also highlights the location of special canopic jars, more on this later, and reveals secret marks on the environment, providing directions leading to either bits of Mary's teaching, basically the equivalent of the hair drops in Infamous 2. There is nothing I enjoy more than strolling down a crowded street on a warm night. Or to the location of unlucky civilians in need of assistance. Another new power is the Shadow Swarm. Holding up on the D-pad turns coal into a swarm of bats, which you can guide freely through the environment as long as you have fresh human blood in your body. Once it's over, you need to refill, and you can do this in three ways. Breaking canopic jars. Stabbing vampires, including the disguised ones. and biting any civilian you come across, provided you choose your victim wisely. Hey, what's with you? Oh, no. The Shadow Swarm also doubles as an attack move, by the way, allowing to ram into enemies for maximum damage. Finally, much like collecting blast shards in the main infamous games extends Cold's battery life, so to speak, collecting canopic jars periodically increases its blood capacity and by consequence the time you can spend shadow swarming around. Eventually you will be able to push Cold to new heights. Speaking of moving around, Festival of Blood takes place in one of the main three areas of New Marae, as you can see by looking at the map here, which you can access at any time by pressing select and pan around using the navigation stick. Zooming is not possible with the move by the way, which is not a huge limitation by any means, but still an odd one, considering all the buttons left unused here, except the X1 which is used to place waypoints. Anyway, back to the Shadow Swarm power, Peach and Yo control are not mapped directly to the move sensors, so don't expect the flight to feel anything like it does in Flower with the S6 axis. The controls here are tied to the camera control system instead, resulting in a slight loose flying experience, a looseness the Tesla missile sequences in Infamous 2, which are based on the same control system, suffer from the most. In the following sequence you can see me flying along the same path with the move first.
and now with the DualShock 3. Notice how, despite starting with the same amount of blood and flying along the very same path, with the DualShock 3 I eventually managed to reach the top of the tower without having to climb. The reason behind this discrepancy is due to the looseness of the move controls, with all the pitch and yaw adjustments needed to follow a straight trajectory, and the less tight turning effectively lengthening the route actually covered. Ok, back to the basic control scheme, holding down the L1 button allows to drain electricity from power sources in your proximity, while tapping it highlights their location. Tapping L1 only highlights power sources as long as there is none within draining reach, if there is any, coal starts draining regardless. The same applies to the DualShock 3 controls, but luckily in both cases you can press L3 to highlight without draining. When in aim mode though, which you enter by holding down L2, L3 serves to switch shoulders, losing its scanning functionality, which is conversely retained with the DualShock 3 as shoulder switching is mapped to R3 there. Not a big deal anyway. Not a big deal either, but worth mentioning regardless is the issue highlighted here when transitioning between look and aim modes as the cursors don't line up over the target. Normally it would be fair to complain about this misalignment, pointing at SOCOM 4 as an example of how it's done in third person shooters. Notice how the camera doesn't simply zoom in, but also turns so that the reticles line up against the target. While definitely annoying at times, especially when you are pretty close to the target, like in this example, it would be unfair to accuse the developers of negligence since you are not supposed to aim from the hip anyway. As a matter of fact, when using the DualShock 3 you don't even have a reticle nor a dot indicating the center of the screen, as it only shows up in aim mode, leaving you unaware of the misalignment issue, which is definitely there though. In fact, if we mark the center of the screen and go into aim mode with the DualShock 3, a similar misalignment to that exposed with the move shows up. Other third person games such as Uncharted 3 don't suffer from this, but that's because they absolutely must not, otherwise it would be rather difficult to keep your targets in check when transitioning from hip fire to zoomed fire. We're sinking. Shoulder swapping is another aim disrupting action that Infamous doesn't deal with by design, so there is little to complain about with regards to move implementation. It's just the way it works, which is not ideal, as Uncharted 3 points out here, but not game breaking either. Overall, since movement and camera speed while in aim mode are faster than in your average third person shooter, there is actually little need for perfect consistency in reticle position. Not to mention you are not firing tiny bullets towards a little dot, but rather lighting balls towards a pretty big circle, with no recoil issues to deal with, plenty of ammo scattered around you and superhuman resistance to damage. So in the context of Infamous it all works fine. On the point of aiming and shooting mechanics, besides the flawless cursor behavior, the move controls provide a few extra advantages over the original ones. Notice here how the camera tilts down to zero pitch as you disengage the aim mode with the DualShock 3, forcing you to look back up again to keep the red light in the middle of the screen. While the game sort of remembers your last aiming angle so that it automatically tilts the camera accordingly next time you press L1, it only does this as long as you don't move neither call nor the camera.
Using the move instead, the camera sticks to the angle you impose across look and aim modes, allowing to effortlessly keep your eyes on your target. Here is another demonstration of this. Notice how the camera behaves as I run down the street here with the DualShock 3, switching between camera modes while it's attempting to look at those rooftops. And here is how the same thing works with the move. See how smoother the whole process plays out as I don't have to fight against the camera assist pushing the camera downwards. During combat then, the unassisted nature of camera orientation when using the move allows to stay focused on your target whatever the actions you perform. Add to this the ability to access any button without leaving the camera unattended and you can see how the move puts a much more efficient and agile core in your hands. Another byproduct of having the camera and the reticle mapped to your wrist is that your rate of fire increases when using powers mapped to the face buttons. See here how fast I can drop grenades, which are mapped to the main move button, all around the square with the move. And here is my attempt at doing the same with the DualShock 3. See how the time wasted to pan the camera around with the DualShock 3 results in a lower fire rate. Now, while the move controls definitely improve your effectiveness in combat, there is one situation where the DualShock 3 control scheme proves to be superior. But before getting there, I need to explain how your powers are mapped to the move buttons. As you have likely guessed already, bolts are fired with the trigger. The move button is for grenades. Triangle for missiles. and X for blast. Ok, now that you know this, let's fly back into the sky. When gliding with the move, the need to hold down the X button means you can only fire balls, as pressing any other button forces you to disengage the thrusters. With the DualShock 3 instead, since gliding is on R1, you can access any face button and its associated power, the only one you can't use without disengaging the thrusters being the lighting bolts. But then again, despite limiting to one power while gliding, the move controls still prove to be superior when it comes to aiming, since camera and cursor are always under your control, which eventually allows to use the lighting bolts more efficiently than any other of the powers with the DualShock 3.
Speaking of powers, let's switch over to Infamous 2 to take a look at some of the other ones which are not included in Festival of Blood. Here again we see the benefits of having your thumb free to move around the face buttons, as powers mapped to R2 on the DualShock 3, like the frost shield you are seeing here, are more comfortably mapped to the square button on the move. It goes without saying that pressing square to use powers such as the ice launch here feels much better than pulling R2. Even more so is holding square to lift objects and pulling the move trigger to throw them, compared to holding R2 and pressing X on the DualShock 3. As for the lightning tether, throwing is on square as well, instead of R2, and having a cursor on the screen at all times makes swinging between buildings quite easier. I could do this all day. Finally, powers mapped to up or down on the DualShock 3 D-pad are mapped to up or down on the navigation controller D-pad as well, so that's how you activate precision balls. Or unleash ionic powers such as the Vortex. Now, out of all these powers, there are two which display an oddity in the pointer behavior I'd like to show you before ending this video. What you see me doing here is firing balls while constantly moving the cursor around. Obviously, the cursor appears to be in a different position at every frame. The same applies to firing rockets. See how the cursor is never in the same spot as I'm constantly waggling the move. Now pay close attention to the cursor as I throw grenades instead. Did you see that? No? Let's rewatch in slow motion. Focus on the cursor and you will notice it stops moving for a few frames. Four frames, to be precise. Let's switch to blasts now. Here you can probably see it even at normal speed, but let's slow the video down again. As you can see, the cursor stays idle for 7 frames, and more precisely those corresponding to the push animation. Looking back to the grenades, you can see the idle frames correspond to the throwing animation as well, so it's definitely not a random thing. And it's not something inherited from the DualShock 3 controls either, as here you see me pushing blast with it without affecting the camera movement.
Just to be sure, I've tested this in Infamous 2 with the move as well, and the same issue shows up with blasts and grenades, so it's not specific to Festival of Blood. So what is it? Is it some sort of stability assist or an actual glitch in the move pointer mechanics? Whatever it is, it sure doesn't do any good to the controls. Look at this sequence here for example. Admittedly I missed the target here the first time, but what about the second blast? Did I suck twice in a row? Rewatching this again in super slow motion suggests otherwise. Notice how after the first miss I readjust the aim in order to get it right the second time, but when the cursor warps to the correct position after its idle time, that basically throws me off, along with the abrupt camera acceleration caused by the cursor spawning farther away from the dead zone, de facto pushing the target farther to the right and by the time that happens, the damage was already done as I was already firing during the whole thing, hence the second miss. Now, don't get me wrong, there is nothing really game breaking here. While there is definitely something wrong going on with the cursor, likely it happens only when using grenades and blasts, which deal wide area damage anyway. Besides, it's not like they don't go where the cursor indicates. They do, it's what happens a few frames later that might actually throw you off, but again, in the heat of the battle it's hardly something you would even notice. And with that, we are done for now. Be sure you watch the second half of this analysis to know more about how Infamous Festival of Blood and Infamous 2 work with the PlayStation Move, as I will discuss the camera system in great detail, exposing the magic behind its quite clever implementation. Thanks for watching and see you there! Ciao!